Okay. So how is everyone today? Good? Good. So um, a few a few written homeworks have been posted. Were you able to find them? Yes. Very good. Uh, what else? The you you are available to register. It 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 is the opportunity to register is available at the for the quizzes at the testing center. Okay, so the testing center and I need you to register for your seat as soon as possible. And just like my message says, that doesn't mean that you're going to take all the quizzes all all at once. No, you're going to take one quiz per week. But I want you to register for your seat now. Okay. So any question about any of that? Yes? We have to register for all of them right now. We register for like quiz one right now, then quiz two next week. Quiz I want you to do it as soon as far in advance as possible. Because that helps everyone with their planning, yes? How long do we have per quiz? Thirty minutes. Yes? Do we have to register like a specific time slot or that it'll ask you for one, yeah. And the thing is, is that if the testing center gets full, okay, then you may have, a time, have to choose a time slot that's not very good for you. So that's why it really is in your interest to go ahead and register for a seat now. Because if you really have it in your heart to take it, to take it on Saturday at noon, okay, that's when everyone wants to take it. So if, if you really want to do that, you need to sign up for them now. Otherwise, you're not going you, to get what you want. There was a question up here. Other questions? Okay, so last time uh, we were talking about, um, we were ma making sort of reviewing standard definitions about what, is it, what does it mean to be open? What does it mean for a set to be open? Uh, what is a, uh, a minimum and what is a maximum? So we, we ended the discussion with uh, a talk about, uh, briefly mentioned what Fermat's theorem is. So now we're going to prove Fermat's theorem. And in case you didn't, don't remember, Fermat's theorem is one of the things that you'll have to prove. Okay. So uh, to remind you of what a local max is, we said this last time, but we'll need it today, so I'll go ahead and write it. Wait, I need to write the date first. Today's the 24th. So a local max. <clears throat> OK. Uh, F, function F. From set X to the reals uh, has a local max <clears throat> at m in x, at a point m in x, uh, when <clears throat> there is a neighborhood B epsilon of M, and I'll explain what that means for those of you who, for whom that's new, that is a subset of X such that F evaluated at X is less or equal to F evaluated at big M for all X in the neighborhood. Okay, so we need to know what a neighborhood is. So to remind you, <clears throat> that B epsilon of X, in case this is the first time you're seeing it, this is the set, uh, well, I don't want to use X, because X meant something else, just a little bit above. Where did I put my eraser? 
<laughs> okay, I'll use this one. B epsilon of M is the set of all Y such that the absolute value of M minus Y is less than epsilon. So that's kind of a convoluted way to say something that's actually pretty simple. Th what does this mean? Mm -hmm. It means that we're talking about an interval that looks like this. An interval that looks like an open interval there to there. And in the middle is point M. What's the left end point? M minus epsilon. And the right end point? M plus epsilon. So a local ma uh, a, a point M is said to be a local max when all of these things are true. So let's draw a picture of what this might look like. So here's a function, f. Okay, so in the definition of a local max, in the definition of a local max, what is x, big X? That is to say, set x in this picture. It's the domain, right? It's all of this down here. So this set down here, from here to here, this is x. Okay, so that means that the minimum, the minimum, uh, sorry, maximum, because that's what we're talking about, the maximum is one of those green points. Okay, the local maximum. So uh, does this particular drawing have any local maxima? That's got two of them, right? So then just for no good reason, I'm going to choose the one on the left. So you can see in the picture that there's a local maximum, but where is it? Is it right there? No, it's a court, the way the language is, the local maximum is right there. It's the input that produces the local maximum. That is to say that you can see that that's the highest point, but the point M is right there. That's M. <clears throat> now, the point that I've selected, uh, input M, does it, does it produce the, the, the maximum value of all con uh, conceivable values for this function? No, right? Does that mean it's not a local maximum? It's still a local maximum because what, what has to exist is a neighborhood. So the question is, is, can I draw a little set, a little symmetric set around M and then cut away all the rest of the function and then M is the biggest one? Yeah, right? So we can do this, say cut this much. Now this set right here that set is the ball B, neighborhood, ra radius epsilon at M. And what that set does is it, if you like, comes back up to the function and cuts away this piece. And now on the blue piece of the function, the piece of the function that is now blue, does that M give the highest possible blue value? Yeah, that's the highest possible blue value. That's what it means for M to be a local maximum. Okay, so then, is this a local maximum? Yes, for exactly the same reasons. For exactly the same reasons. Uh, however, not only is it a local maximum, it is also a maximum. That is to say, we might 
retroactively rename the maximum as a global maximum. So not only is this one local, that is to say this point down here, not only is this point a local maximum, it is also a global maximum. Okay, so this would be a point of global max and also local max. How about this one? We just established that it was local. Is it global? No, it's just local, local only. Okay, with, this, with, with just a little bit of modification, I think you could believe me when I say that this one is a local minimum. Okay, uh, is it a global minimum? It is not. Where is the global minimum? That one. So this is the global minimum. So this one is local. This one is global, men. Now here's the, here's the million dollar question. That one on the left, it is a global min. Is it a local min? It is not. It is not a local min. Why is it not a local min? Because there's no range epsilon that is low as particular. Right. Consider, putting, consider moving a point to right there at the end point. Can you fit a neighborhood inside of the green X set? Can you fit a neighborhood in there? No. The neighborhood's always going to be hanging off the edge. Okay. So, a, a global min, a global extremum which is not local, a local that is not global, and something that is local and global. So all, all things are, all combinations are conceivable. Okay. <clears throat> so I won't even bother writing the definition for local min because I think it's clear. Any question about this? You are purposefully leaving it open for the These are open, yeah, because because down here this is an open this is a neighborhood which is open, yeah. <coughs> Other questions? Yes. So the the rightmost point is that just nothing. It's just nothing. It's just a nothing. <coughs> it's an endpoint. I'm sh I'm sure its mother thinks it's special, right? <laughs> okay. <coughs> So for Moss theorem, <clears throat> so for Moss theorem is the statement that if uh, we have f is a function from x to C, uh, X to the reals, and C in X is a local extremum, to say local extremum is just a way to say we're either talking about a local minimum or a local maximum. So if, if this is the case, then C is a critical point of F. Okay, now there's two, we went over this last time, there's two varieties of critical point. What are they? Yes, the derivative is zero and the derivative doesn't exist. So that's the, that's the analytic condition. Non-smooth and stationary, that's sort of the, the language condition. And then where geometry is concerned, what does that mean? Or there is no tangent. Either the tangent is horizontal or there is no tangent. Now, just as a, a brief warning, uh, the, way, the way this class will go and the way most of your math classes will go is that uh, you need to be careful about the word flat. Okay, because to a mathematician, flat does not mean horizontal. For example, every line is flat, even the ones that are sloped. 
Every plane is flat, even the ones that are sloped. So when you're talking about, when you, when you mean that water wouldn't run off of them, that's horizontal. Okay? So uh, now we want to prove this. We want to prove that this is true. <clears throat> So there's uh, two possibilities. There's two possibilities. So here's the proof. And the first question is the following. Consider the limit. The limit as x goes to c of f of x minus f of c, c, over x minus c. Of course, what is this? Yeah, this is the definition of derivative of f at c. This limit either exists or it doesn't. There, there's no other possible scenario. So if this doesn't exist, if this does not exist, then what? then C is a critical point by <coughs> definition, right? Then there's nothing more to say. Then C is a critical point. Point. <coughs> okay. So that was, <laughs> that was easy. The, the more interesting case is, what if the limit does exist? So assume, assume that the limit, this limit, exists. And now what we want to do is we want to show what must be true about this limit. It has to be zero. So we want to show that this limit is zero. <clears throat> well, because C is a, local, uh, is a local extremum, let's assume furthermore that uh, C is a local max. Because there's two possibilities. C is either a local max or it's a local min. So for now, we're going to take the case that, that C happens to be a local max. And we'll c circle back around to the case when it's a local min. <clears throat> Let B epsilon of C, of C be a neighborhood. <clears throat> such that. f uh, of x is less or equal to f of c for all x in the neighborhood of c. So why, why are we sure that such a neighborhood exists? That's, that's what it means to be a local max. Okay, we, that neighborhood surely exists. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so now, Suppose, let's draw a picture of this. I keep looking for my eraser. There's some, oh, it's right. Okay, good. So now, I'd like for you to suppose that we have some x that's in the ball of radius epsilon about c, but that it's on the left of c. That is to say that we're talking about a neighborhood that looks like this. And I'm 
presently saying that let's consider the case when we've got an x that's in the neighborhood and it's right there. It's on that side. We're going to deal with the other side in a minute. <clears throat> I'd like for you to consider then uh, x minus c this is either going to be positive or negative or zero. What's it going to be? It's going to be negative, right? Because c is the larger one. So this is negative. This is negative. It, it, can't, be, it can't be equal to zero because I'm specifically saying that I'm choosing a c that is to the left. Uh, an x that's to the left of c. So not, not to the left or equal, but rather strictly to the left. OK. Furthermore, I'd like for you to consider, what about f of x minus f of c? What is the SIGN of that? Negative. It's going to have to be negative. not quite negative. We can't make it, we can't quite, we can't quite say negative. Non-positive, right? <laughs> so we're all math majors. What's the difference between negative and non-positive? You can that's including zero, possibly. So this is true because because of that, right? Because of that one. So now I want you to consider uh, this is negative, and this is either negative or zero. So as a result of these, therefore. <coughs> I'd like for you to, to observe that f of x minus f of c divide by x minus c would be what? Non would have to be non-negative, non right? Let's think about this for a moment. Uh, this inequality, this inequality, if we were to divide it, just that one that you can see there, if you divide it by 5, does the direction of the inequality change? No. Right? That, that's a permissible thing and the direction doesn't change. What if you divide it by negative 4? It's still permissible, but what? The direction of the inequality changes. So what I'd like for you to observe is that we're, we're dividing that by x minus c, which is negative. So what will happen to the direction of the inequality? It will, it will reverse and look like this, greater or equal to 0. Okay. So now, this is true. This is true for any x that's in the neighborhood on the left side. On the left side. So what I want you to consider now is we're going to take this x, uh, this x right here, and we're going to push it to c in a limit. We're going to make it go toward c. So we're going to compute the limit as x goes to c. But because we're approaching from the left, right, we'll denote that we're coming from the left. As a result, we have that the limit as x goes to c from the left of f of x minus f of c over x minus c must be greater or equal to 0. Must be greater or equal to 0. Good. Any question about this? Now, for those of you who are like to speculate, what do you think is the next sequence of things I'm going to demonstrate? I'm going to show that the limit from the right must be what? Non-positive. Right? We've shown, we've shown that the limit from the left is non-negative. We're going to show that the limit from the right is non-positive. And since the limit must exist, the only number that is both non-negative and non-positive is zero. So let's do it. Let's finish it up. <clears throat> now suppose that uh, x is in the ball of radius epsilon centered at c, but now it's on the right of c, which is to say we've got this interval 
with C in the middle, and we're selecting an X somewhere on the right, like so. <clears throat> then, well, let's consider the same quantities. X minus C is going to be positive, negative, or zero. Positive. Is positive because X is further to the right. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, can we make these statements without knowing that C is already a maximum? No. You can't. No. The reason why you can't is because this, this one right, right here, is a result of it being a max. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were, if I was missing something or if that's why. Okay, yeah, this right here. Let, let's, let's put that there so that doesn't get lost. This is a result of C being a max, a local max. <clears throat> Similarly, so as, as we just said, this, this will be positive because X is the one that's further to the right. Uh, so then F of X minus F of C how about this? Less or equal, right? Less or equal to zero. Because, because remember, th th this, we could conceivably be talking about a constant function. Right? Then, then everything is maximal and minimal. So if you, if you were to divide this by a positive number, the direction would, of the inequality would be unchanged. If you divide it by a negative number, the direction would be reversed. We are going to divide by this positive quantity. What will happen to the direction of the inequality? It will be unchanged. So as a result of these things, f of x minus f of c divided by x minus c is less or equal to zero. That's true for any x that's in the neighborhood and on the right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to take this x now and we're going to push it to c in a limit. So we're going to compute the limit as x goes to c from the right. Uh, other way. Less or equal to zero. So now, the thing is, the thing is, is that we're currently in the situation that the limit must exist. Why are we in the situation that this limit must exist? Because we already did that trivial case right at the beginning. We said, well, what if the limit doesn't exist? Then it's a critical point because there's no tangent and there's nothing further to say. So let's, let's, be, let's be with the situation where the limit does exist. Well, the left limit, the left limit is greater or equal to zero. And the right limit is less or equal to zero. And, it must, and both of these limits exist. And they must be the same. And therefore, there is only one conclusion, that the limit is zero. So we have this one and the one on the previous page and taking all those together left and right limits must be the same therefore it must be the case that the limit as x goes to c generally which is to say without a superscript negative or positive of f of x minus f of c divided by x minus c must be equal to zero. And what, what does that mean? Th well, th yeah, this is the definition of derivative, right? So therefore, the derivative of f at c is zero, and therefore c is a stationary point, or a critical point. C is a OK. That's neat. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I don't think like this at all. <laughs> this is all completely forced, okay, from, 
me translating the way it actually appears in my head. So let's go over this proof a little bit because one thing that you will find, uh, all of you are, oh, well, for one, for one thing, at the end of a proof, you write something that, that uh, signifies that you're finished. <laughs> you can write QED, which is a Latin initialism for something like quid erat demonstratum, which is to say, which is what we wanted to show. So we did it. The other thing, you can write this, or you can write another thing. Don't write both of them. I'm writing both of them just, just so you can see both of them. But don't write both of them because it, it looks like you put two periods at the end of a sentence. This thing is called a tombstone because we've put the argument to rest. Okay? <clears throat> So, uh, wait, there is, there is one thing that's left open. What's left open? Yes? If it's a minimum. So what we did is we established the case for if f is a minimum. Uh, a maximum, thank you. So it's left open right now if f is a minimum. But this is a triviality now. How can we fix it? Well, we could, we could redo the whole argument again and flip all of the and flip all of the inequalities. We could do that, but there's something even, even cuter and more clever. Well, let's consider. The standard parabola, it has a min, right? That's the kind of thing we're talking about. The standard parabola, it has a min. What if you negate the standard parabola, the output of the standard parabola? Then what are you looking at? A max. Therefore, if f has a min, then negative f has a max. And we, can, and we can just say, and the same argument applies. So we'll do that. So if c is a min, a local min, of f, then c is a local max. of negative f. And the same argument applies. Okay, now we put it to rest. So it's not necessary to do both cases. You just do one and say, and now do the same thing for negative f if it had a minimum. Good. Yes? It'll be obvious, I think. But I have to say, you know, case by case basis. So, where's the thing? Here's the thing. So, let's talk about this proof for a minute. Where'd the other one go? I wrote something So the way that, that that proof actually works in my head, now this doesn't constitute a proof. This just constitute, constitutes the way I think about it and to help you navigate through the proof when it's your turn to be in the hot seat. So you have a function and you imagine a local max. Okay, so then there's, this function has a, you can see that the maximal output is right there, so that we could say that down here, say, is the domain. And this is the point C. So now, I'd like for you to look, what if you select a point that's a little bit to the left of C? Like this point. And then you take this back up to the function, and you choose that point right there. And we'll call this, uh, this point x, because that's what we were calling it in the proof. 
and we'll call this point, uh, we've already called it C. I'd like for you to look at the line that connects those two points, the line that connects those two. What's the name of, of the line that connects two points on the same function? Secant, right? So look at the secant going through these. And you should be able to tell me without any reservations, does this particular secant have, have positive slope, negative slope, or zero, or what? It has positive slope. Okay. And what is, what is the slope of this secant? Right, good. So the slope of this secant is f of x minus f of c over x minus c. It's also equal to if you switch the positions of the x's and the c's. But the proof is easier to deal with if you do it like this. <laughs> so this, that's got to be, it, in the picture it's positive, but in the proof, really it needs to be uh, non-negative, right? So in the proof, you've got to establish that this is true when you're on the left, when you're on the left. And then you've got to, you've got to establish an analogous thing when you happen to be on the right. So if you're over here, then there's another secant, this secant. Of course, the formula for that secant is the same, f of x minus f of c over x minus c. But you can see from the picture that what, what should be true about the slope of this secant? It should be non-positive. Okay, good. Any question about this? Once you establish these things, then uh, you've proved Fermat's theorem. So Fermat's theorem is the implication that if you are at a relative extremum, then you're at a critical point. How about the converse of Fermat's? Is it true? That is to say, if you're at a critical point, does that mean that you're at an extremum? No, that is not true. So what's the, what is the standard example? So let's write this down, the converse of Fermat. is false that is to say if you are at a critical point that is that does not mean you're at an extremum that's not true so what's an example what is a uh, a counter example for the converse of Fermat x cubed at zero so consider the function f of x is x cubed its derivative of course is 3x squared and do you observe, of course, that the derivative at 0 is 0? Yet, let's look at the plot. The plot of the cubic function looks something like this. At the origin, there is a tangent, and it is horizontal. Okay, so that means that the origin is a critical point, yet it is not maximal and it is not minimal. Any question about Fermat? Okay. <clears throat> yes? There's an even, so I, th I think you're asking, let me, let me see if I can rephrase your question. You're talking about what about implications for Fermat in higher dimensions? Yes. It's a lot easier once you have this one. When you have this one, then you, you'll, we're going to do it anyway. So you'll, you'll see. It's a lot easier when you have this one proved. And you will have it proved because you'll do it. Okay. <clears throat> so the next one is Rolle's theorem. So what's Rolle's theorem? Anybody? Yeah? I think it's, uh, if you have a continuous differentiable function on a closed interval uh, and the uh, endpoints map to zero, then the derivative is zero at some point between 
You're, you're pretty. You're really pretty close. Fun, little little, okay. little fine details that are missing. So let's write it. Yeah. I mean, ten points is the same. So, or right. Like he said. Um, They've got to be at the same level on the ends. I agree. I agree. Okay, so here, here's Rolle's theorem. Uh, let, uh, let F be defined on set X to the reals, and let AB, closed and, bound, closed and bounded interval, be a subset of X. So we've got, we've got a set that's defined on some, some set, some, some big set, and uh, this closed and bounded interval is a subset of it. If, first requirement, so F is continuous on the closed and bounded interval. So it has to be continuous on that thing. Now here's something that many students don't have quite right but when they first get here. F needs to be differentiable but where? On the corresponding open interval. Differentiability is not necessary at the endpoints. And three, yes, the endpoints must be the same. Must evaluate to the same value. So supposing these three conditions are true, then there exists a C in where? A, B could mean more than one thing. The open interval. The open interval. The fact that it's in the open interval in the end is what is part of what's driving almost all of the machinery in this class. Not in the closed interval, the open interval. There is a C in the open interval such that the derivative at this C is what? Zero. So let's, let's have a look. Uh, we're going to prove this on the next page. Uh, I want you to have a look at what this theorem is saying. It's saying something like the following. Suppose you take one point and another point at their at, and they're at the same height. So they're at the same height. And now you have to start drawing at one point, and you have to finish drawing at the other point. And what you have to draw is continuous, so you're not allowed to pick up your pen. And furthermore, uh, there has to be a tangent everywhere except at the end points. So you, ha it has, you have to do so smoothly. So I'd like for you to do that. Draw any kind of crazy thing that you want. It's got to be a function, got to start there, got to end there, got to be differentiable in between. So here we go. I don't want to get too crazy. What is, what is Rolle's theorem saying? <laughs> Something like that. It's saying that somewhere inside, there's got to be a point where there's a horizontal tangent. That's what it's saying. Are there any horizontal tangents on the one I drew? There's two of them. Rolle's theorem is saying there's got to be at least one. So I happen to draw a situation where there's two. And if you, did, if you followed the instructions, then there is one <laughs> on yours. Okay. So now, I'd like for you to observe that every one of those conditions is necessary. Every one of them. Not, not even one can be relaxed. So, for example, I'll relax the differentiability. I'll say, I'll make it differentiable at every interior point except one. That means that it'll be, like, there's, there's infinitely many points in the interior between these two. And I'm going to make it differentiable at all of them except one. Is there a horizontal tangent? There isn't one. Even, even, though we, even though we satisfied infinitely many requirements and we just left one out. It's differentiable everywhere but there. Okay. 
What if, what if, we relax the continuity requirement? So we make it not continuous at just one point. Okay, well that's even worse, right? Because we could do it like this. We could say, okay, I'll define it to be that there, and I'll do it like this. So it's, it's a function that, that is a straight line and then jumps down and hits that. So the endpoints are the same. It's differentiable in the interior, and it fails to be continuous at exactly the right endpoint. Is there a horizontal tangent? There is not. The last one's even worse. What if you don't put the, what if they're not at the same elevation? Right. Well, then you can just draw a straight line. Straight line would do it. That's conti this is continuous and differentiable. Continuous on the closed interval, differentiable on the open interval, but the endpoints are not the same. Is there a horizontal tangent for this? There's not. None of these can be relaxed. Every one of them is necessary. Okay, so now let's prove this. Let's prove this result. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Proof. Now in the first place, I'd like for you to observe that because this function is continuous on a closed and bounded interval, what enormous result can we use? There's something, a result that's underneath all of the results in this class that we mentioned on the first day, and I said, we're not gonna prove it, but it's true. Not that one, we're gonna prove that. <laughs> the extreme value theorem. We're gonna prove the fundamental theorem too. No, it's the extreme theorem, the extreme value theorem. What does the extreme value theorem say? It, you don't need any differentiability, just, co just continuity. Right. If you, if you take a continuous function mapping a closed and bounded interval, then there must be a place in that closed and bounded interval where the minimum and the maximum occur. They have to occur. There's no way you can get around them occurring. So, because f is continuous, on the closed and bounded interval A to B, the extreme value theorem applies. And as a result, therefore, there exists little m and big M in the closed and bounded interval A to B such that m is the min, little m is the min, and big M is the max. Okay. <clears throat> so now what we desperately want, we want uh, to find a critical point that's in the middle, in the interior what, of this interval. So what do I mean by in the interior? The yeah, in the open interval, right? We need to find a critical point that's inside. No, that, that is to say, not on the boundary. Okay, so here's a nice little uh, navigation of all the possibilities. So here's a statement, and I'm taking this to be a predicate. To, this, is, this is either true or false. That the minimum is in the interior. So I'm not saying it is, I'm asking a, I'm asking a, a question. Is it in the interior? Okay, so this, the answer to this to this predicate is either true or false, right? Those are all the conceivable possibilities. Well, let's consider, let's consider if it's true. What if little m is in the interior? Well, that means that we found a local min, right? That means that c equal to little m is a local min. And I'm going to put that on pause for a minute. Okay, now we're going to look at the other branch for a moment. So if, if this predicate is false, what does that mean about little m? It's an endpoint. That means that the minimum 
the minimum occurs at an end point. So it looks like it only goes up, right? It's like a bow. It, it only goes up. So that means that as a result of this, as a result of this, it must be true that little m is a or little m is b. So now I'm going to ask another question. So now I'm going to ask, what about the maximum? The maximum is either in the interior or it is not. Those are the only possibilities. What if it is? So it either is not or it is. What, what can we conclude if we find ourselves at this position in the decision tree? That, that big M is a local max. Okay, now we're going to put this branch on pause for a moment and look at this one. What does this one say? Yes, this is saying that big M is A or big M is B. But in either case, in either case, F of A is F of B. So it doesn't matter what, what big M is, F of big M is the same. And in particular, it's the same as what? F of little m. This is saying that the minimum occurs at the boundary. This one is saying that the maximum occurs at the boundary. If you take these two together, if you have a function where the minimum, a function on an interval, the minimum occurs at the boundary, and the maximum occurs at the boundary, and the boundary points are the same, then what's true about this function? It's a horizontal line. If you take these together, taking these together, the conclusion is that f is a constant function. That means that, in particular, every point, every point is extremal. Every point is maximal. Every point is minimal. They're all extremal. So let's come up with a specific one. So I'll say C equal to the midpoint, A plus B over 2, is a local extremum. Now, I'd like for you to observe this nice position we have found ourselves in. Notice that we've exhausted all logical possibilities. We've said that, suppose we come here, we found a local extremum. Suppose we find ourselves here, we found a local extremum. Suppose we find ourselves here, we found a local extremum. A local extremum, no matter what. And so, what's the name of the previous theorem? Fermat's theorem, and what does Fermat's theorem say about local extrema? They're critical points. Okay, so that means that all of these now join, they all join, and we can conclude that this local extremum that we're guaranteed to find is a critical point. C is a critical point. Now there's two varieties of critical point. What are they? Not, not that kind. The derivative, is zero. the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist. Okay, which is to say there is a tangent and it's horizontal or there is no tangent. Which case are we in here? What, so why is that? Have we got something against no tangents? Why must, it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> why, why, must, why must it be the case that the tangent is horizontal and not? Functional means it's differential. Because one of your conditions was it has to be differential. 
There it is, right? The, the last condition that we haven't said. We've used, we've used all of the tools except for this one. Here's where we finally use this one. It's differentiable. So C is stationary. Because we've established that C is an interior point and F is differentiable at every interior point. So that's the result. Beautiful. You have to logically exhaust all possibilities. So what I want to point out to you is that this whole thing this whole thing is just a, 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 a game where you're trying to force the existence of a point in the interior. It's, it's critical. I don't want to use critical because we say critical point. It is, what's the synonym for critical? Generic. Essential. Yeah, I like that one. It is essential, necessary, necessary that, that the point that we find is in the interior. You ha it has to be that way. Okay, and then once you, once you have established that no matter what, there's an interior local extremum, then for Ma, you just immediately apply, apply for Ma and say, there we have it. Okay? That's where the derivative is zero. Okay? Any question about the proof of roles? So when we give you this proof, are we uh -huh. going to draw fun diagrams like this? By all means. Okay. But if you don't like drawing things, this is how it works in my head. When I'm imagining draw, doing these proofs, I'm Im closing my eyes and watching the flow chart. Okay, but a lot of, I'm trying to give you a variety of different kinds of proofs because different people like different things. A lot of people think of it just like this. This is, I can't really stand this, but, but it's still right. I, I prefer this. Other questions? We need a tombstone. <laughs> It's also called a Halmos, because there's a very famous mathematician named Paul Halmos who popularized the use of the tombstone. And he's the one that said, we put the argument to rest. Are the lines always in the same direction? It's supposed to be filled in, okay. Just like, a, like, a, like a black square. Um, That's how you do it in fancy journals and stuff. Is that the phrase on his tombstone? I'm sorry? Is that the phrase on his tombstone? <laughs> I don't know, but if he didn't put it on his own tombstone, he missed an opportunity. <laughs> I, I am proven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, that's Rolle's theorem. So now we, wanna, we want to state and prove the mean value theorem. Now, mean value theorem is is in a sense just a, just a corollary, almost, of Rolle's theorem. It's, it's very similar. So, yes, I, I agree. <laughs> and that is, it starts out almost exactly the same. Let f from x to the reals, and let closed and bounded interval a to b be a subset of x. If the first two conditions of Rolle's theorem are true, So if the first two conditions of Rolle's theorem are true, that f is continuous on the closed and bounded interval, and two, f is differentiable on the corresponding open interval, and notice that I'm not going to go on to make any requirement about the endpoints being the same. I'm no longer requiring that. That, that was the requirement for Rolle's, but we're dropping that for the mean value theorem. Then what's the conclusion? Yes. There is a C still in the interior. Essential. <laughs> Necessary. In the interior. Such that, and it's still going to be true that the derivative of at C is equal to something, but it's not zero anymore. What's it going to be? Very good. So it will be f of b minus f of a divided by b 
b minus a. Now, I'd like for you to observe that if f, if f of a was equal to f of b, if that were true, then what would this be? That'd be zero. That'd be Rolle's theorem. That is to say, if these two were the same and you were subtracting them, you'd have a zero up there, and you'd have Rolle's theorem. Okay? <clears throat> now, just like we did on the previous thing, let's draw some pictures and, sh and, 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 and say what this, and illustrate what this is saying. Suppose you have two points, and they're not necessarily at the same elevation. I want you to draw a function, starting at the one point, ending at the other, continuous, and you have to draw it something differentiable in between. That means no, no uh, corners, no, no, none of that. Have to have a tangent at every point. Okay, so without any further ado, so there's my example. So now this this red thing, this is this is uh, F. F is in red. Now, with, those t with the start and end point, I want you to draw the secant of f from those endpoints. That is to say, draw from the one graphite point to the other, a straight line, which is an oxymoron, right? Straight line. A line. Oxymoron? No. Redundant? Pleonasm. Pleonasm. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds better. So the green one, this is the secant. Now, what is the mean value theorem saying? Right. That there is, there, is a, there is a tangent inside of here that's parallel to the secant. Can you see any tangents that would be parallel to the secant? There's going to be two of them, right? Just eyeballing it, it looks about right there and another one approximately there. So those blue tangents are parallel to that secant. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. And this is the reason why this is a foreshadowing of why this result is important and why we're doing it at the beginning of the class. I'd like for you to observe, I'm covering up all the stuff that F is doing, okay, so that you can only see the endpoints. Now, this expression, this thing right here, the secant, it can be evaluated without any knowledge of what's happening in here. I'm covering it all up. It, only, only with knowledge of what's happening on, on the outside, you can come up with this expression. You don't need to know what's happening inside. What the mean value theorem is saying it's saying that if F is well-behaved, if it's a well-behaved machine on the inside, then you can make a measurement on the outside, and that tells you something about what's happening inside. That's what it's saying. It's allowing you to make a trade between the outside of an object, behavior that's measurable outside, for behavior that's measurable inside. It's sort of like saying, okay, uh, here's, here's something neat about, about uh, human beings. Okay, we're well behaved inside. Okay, if you were to open us up, there's not unicorns in there. Uh, I, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> okay, there's, not, there's not magic in there. Okay? There's molecules in there. And if you, if you measure something, okay, if you go to the doctor, if you go to the doctor, the physician, and you say, I'm not feeling well. I'm not feeling well. And the doctor says, well, get on the table, I'll get out my scalpel, and we'll just open you right up. You should say, how about no, right? <laughs> how, about, how about no? Let's, I, I actually am very regular inside, just like everyone else. Let's start with measuring some things outside. Like, how about you take my temperature? Or check my pulse or something. Let's not, let's not go to this, to the inside yet. Okay? That makes... It, it makes perfectly good scientific sense to do that because each one of us is a machine that is, is operating with, according to normal principles inside, not magic. Okay? That's what this is saying. 
Okay, and the fundamental theorem is saying something even more incredible. So, uh, I'm not going to do it, but I want you to do it. I want you to do just like, just like we drew a couple of these where I said, well, let's relax a condition and show something that breaks it. In this, pl in this place, I want you to go through the same thing. Relax the continuity, show how it breaks. Relax the differentiability, show how it breaks. Okay. <clears throat> Now let's prove the mean value theorem. <laughs> it's such a good proof, it's almost like a trick. It is a trick. So here's the thing. We've got this point and this point. And we've got something like this. and this. And if you were reading all this stuff that we wrote on the previous page, what are the coordinates of that point? A, f of A, right? So this is point A, f of A. And what's this one? B, f of B. So what I'd like for you to observe is that what if, what if we took this uh, and we pulled it all the way down until it hit, hit the floor, right here? And it just sort of bunk and it hit, so that this one was at height zero. So now it's at height zero. And what if, furthermore, we subtract that green secant from the red? Okay, so that is to say that these are currently both at height zero. And then if we subtract the green secant from the red, then what would the right endpoint be at? Zero. Also zero, because if, if this is, say, at six, well, the red and the green are both at six, aren't they? And if we subtract the, the green from the red, then this one would be zero minus zero, and this one on the right, and on the, uh, on the left it would be zero minus zero, on the right it would be six minus six, they'd both be at zero. And if we were to do that, if we were to just adjust this picture just a little bit, then what would it be? It'd be Rolle's theorem, right? Mean value theorem, Rolle's theorem, mean value theorem, Rolle's theorem. Okay, let's find the equation for the line. So what's the slope of this, of this secant? Right. So do you recall from uh, grade school or whenever it was that we did that, that the point slope formula for a line is y minus y0 is m times x minus x0? OK. So then y minus, I'll do the left point, y minus f of a is, what's the slope? We already said it. f of b minus f of a over b minus a, and then multiplied by x minus a. So that's taking x0, y0 to be that point, and the slope m to be the slope of the secant. Okay, so now I'm going to move this f of a to the right-hand side, and I'm going to call that function g. So g of x is, this is just a constant, f of b minus f of a over b minus a multiplied by x minus a and then plus f of a. That's the equation of the green secant. So this, this one gives the secant. So now I'm going to make a new function. Define h of x to be, this is not really mathematical here, but you'll take my meaning, I think, this one minus this one. That is to say, the red, the red wiggle minus the straight green line. That's f minus g, right? So f minus all of that. <clears throat> so that'd be f minus f of b minus f of a 
over b minus a multiplied by x minus a and then minus f of a because I distributed the subtraction. Now let's check. Does H, our intention, remember, was to make H satisfy Rolle's theorem. So how about G? Let's consider G. G is a line. Is it continuous and differentiable? It sure is. So when you, when you perform the subtraction of two continuous and differentiable functions, the result is still continuous and differentiable. Okay, so, so H is surely continuous and differentiable. So we didn't, we didn't lose that. What do we need to establish about H? Yeah, we need the boundaries to be the same now. Right? So what do you get if you plug in A? That is to say, x is a. You get this, that would be f of a, and then minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a, because that's just a constant. And then what's a minus a? Zero, right? And then minus f of a. So we have f of a minus zero minus f of a. How much is that? Seven, too true. So it's zero. Now, I don't want to ruin it, but what do you think H of B is? Is it five? Also five, yes. So H evaluated at B, let's plug it all in. So this would be F evaluated at B minus, F of B minus F of A over B minus A, multiplied by B minus A, and then minus F of A. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Notice that this b minus a cancels with that b minus a. So that after a little bit of work here, we have that this is f of b minus f of b, and then distributing the subtraction plus f of a, and then minus f of a, and altogether that is zero. So do you observe that the endpoints are the same? And now we can apply so as a result of all of that, therefore, H satisfies Rolle's theorem. And therefore, according to Rolle's, there's a C in the open interval such that what? H's derivative is zero, right, at, at this C. Okay, so that's good. We needed a C that was in the interior. So now we have one. What do we, from here, what do we need to establish? Yeah, what does, this, what does this mean for F? Well, let's consider. This is H. That's H right there. So. Let's take this definition of H. And compute its derivative. Well, in the first place, the derivative of H would be the derivative of F, whatever that is. How about this term right there? What's the derivative of that one? Zero, because f of a is a constant. So that one just differentiates away. OK, now we have a linear thing, a monomial, uh, a, a monic linear thing. So we could do this constant, the secant constant, multiplied by a. That would be a constant, so it would differentiate away. So the only thing that's left is the derivative of what you can see there. Well, what is the derivative of what you can see there? That secant constant, right? Because this is, it's like I'm covering up a 5. What's the derivative of 5x? Five, 5. And what's the derivative of 10x? 10, right? What's the derivative of this constant times x? This constant. So this is minus, uh, minus 
f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And therefore, the derivative of h evaluated at c is the derivative of f evaluated at c minus this stuff. But h prime at c is also what? It's also 0. So taking those two together, taking this one with this one, gives us the conclusion that we were after. Therefore, the derivative of f at this c is the secant value, the secant slope. Which is what we wanted to show. Okay, any question about the mean value theorem? So the very next thing we're going to do is the fundamental theorem, and then we're going to get to vectors and all that kind of good stuff. So have a nice, uh, have a nice weekend.